for more on BHP Billiton's profit report, I spoke a short time ago to the company's chief financial officer, Alex Fancelo. Alex Fancelo, welcome to the program. My pleasure being here. This was an extraordinary year for BHP Billiton. and prices for some of your commodities fell by up to 90% in the first half. They rebounded by up to 90% in the second half, though overall they're still lower than they were a year ago. What's the outlook? Uh, that's actually the nature of the business. It's a very cyclical business and where we differentiate ourselves is in the diversity of our portfolio. We have many commodities that behave differently at different times. Uh, in terms of outlook, uh, the outlook that we're given is that we've seen the restocking of China basically completing. And China has been a big locomotive in this, in this recovery on, on the commodities. But we've seen earlier than we expected some of the restocking in the developed countries starting. Uh, the only difference is that the intensity of materials in the, rec the restocking in the, developing co the developed countries is a bit less intense than in China. So we expect uh, this process to continue, but we're not going to have a very clear visibility until probably sometime next year. Well, in terms of China, do you believe that restocking is now complete? Uh, we believe it's mostly complete. Uh, and the signs that we've seen in some of the July numbers would support that. Where do you think demand goes from here? I think what you have in China is with the, the stimulus uh, that has been um, affected by the government, especially the monetary policy that have been relaxed, you see some real demand coming through and that in the way of construction and infrastructure. And we expect that to continue. We believe China is on track to achieving their target of 8% growth this year. So that will provide the backdrop for demand. But the added of, of the restocking, the added volume of that, I think that you're going to see uh, taming down uh, as we go forward. So if you look at the year ahead, where do you think overall demand will recover to? Where does it settle? Yeah, it is very, it's very difficult to, to, to foresee that. That's a, a, key, a, a key part of our outlook. We believe it's still very unclear where that will go. We need to understand how the restocking in the, developing, the developed countries will work, and we need to understand if there is a, a, a physical demand behind that. And at this stage, we're, we are not ready to make that call. You're optimistic? Um, a finance director is usually a pessimistic. So I would say that I'm, I'm a conservative uh, person. And if you look at the way that we have maintained the gearing in, in, in our portfolio at very low levels, at 12%, uh, a solid cash position, you're going to see that we are prepared for whatever comes ahead of us. Well, indeed, even if uh, demand picks up, given what your CEO said this evening about idle capacity, there's unlikely to be any more price increases? Uh, that, that's, that's a very good observation because there are capacity that if prices start to show some sign of recovery, that capacity can come back up. Uh, so there is a buffer that's created by this uh, spare or, or, or passive capacity in the market. Uh, but in the long term, we believe the story is still very valid. Uh, the urbanization of large population will continue and we'll see the demand for our products in the long term continue to grow. And that's why we invest in, in our organic growth in our backyard so heavily. Well, you talk about investing. You've got record cash flows, $18 billion. Close to $6 billion of that will be spent on the iron ore joint venture with Rio Tinto in the Pilbara. What other opportunities are there? What else are you looking at in the current environment? Yeah, it is actually uh, record cash flows, record investment in the business, uh, close to $11 billion, and record dividend to shareholders as well, $4.6 billion. Uh, we, we, we like tier one assets. We like assets that are expendable, assets that are sitting in the low part of the cost curve, and we'll keep an eye open for those when and if they become available. And if they do, we'll be ready to, to, to make an attempt to acquire those. So if you go out buying, you're talking tier one, you're talking big purchases, not little bolt-ons, you're talking something big. Uh, tier one assets tend to be very large, uh, as you saw the example of Olympic Dam. And as you see now with the joint venture with Iron Ore, where we're putting our two tier one assets together and making an even better asset. But we are acquiring part of their production in, 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 that, in that process. So this type, this type of assets is what we are looking for. Have you found any? I think there are a lot of them around the place, but nothing has come to the market uh, so far. 
Well, if we look at that iron ore joint venture with Rio Tinto in the Pilbara, given what's happened to Rio in China, is that affecting progress on that joint venture? Yeah, look, uh, the joint venture is progressing at full steam ahead. Uh, we are working together on the regulatory side of things. There are many reg regulatory agencies that we have to clear. And we're also working on the details of the joint venture that fit under the umbrella of the broader framework that has been agreed. So those two components are, are progressing according to plan. And what about for BHP in China, the arrest of those four Rio employees, including Stern Hu, were part of a wider investigation into iron ore pricing. Has that investigation touched BHP or has it in any way affected the way you do business in China? Look, uh, for us it's business as usual with China. Every ton of iron ore that we produce has been sold. So we haven't been affected by any of, of the issues that are occurring with, in, in that country. But as Marius Klopp has said today, you'd be disingenuous if you didn't say you were watching it closely? Absolutely, we're watching closely. We're trying to understand uh, what it means, uh, trying to get a better understanding of the situation, trying to get some facts. Uh, but we haven't been affected. Were you stunned? Uh, I think stunned is, is, a, is a strong word. I would say surprised, absolutely surprised, yes. There still hasn't been any outcome to your price negotiations in China. Are they actively ongoing? Um, there, there are always some sort of price negotiation going forward. Uh, unfortunately, iron ore has that characteristics that we're trying to change so, so, uh, um, how you say it, uh, so firmly. Because we believe, like, there's no discussions what the price of copper is going to be or what the price of copper is. You have a transparent curve that anybody can take a view on on the price of copper. And we believe there should be no reason why an iron ore is any different. So we've been working very hard supporting that initiative of making an index available where the price of iron ore can be, you know, identified every day and people can take their own views on the price. It becomes a non-event. How would that fit in with the apparent desire of China's Iron Ore and Steel Association for unified pricing? Well, then you have to ask them. But I think if you want to have some sort of fixed price, you can always lock the price view on, on, on a liquid uh, paper market. So if there is a desire to have a formal fixed price, they can always take initiative to do that. Alex Fanzalo, many thanks for talking to Late Line Business. My pleasure.